um, we're at Baby Island. We're about 96 uh, air kilometers from Inuvik and about 120 miles by boat. Oh, here we go. Jump to the pump. Last of the, the last of the real old timers, and that's where he picked picked up his philosophy from, and where he got all his um, kind of values and his ways. And I grew up in a different world. Uh, my name is Ken Allenstein. I'm the producer on this project. It's a documentary entitled "My Father, My Teacher." Doing it with APTN, Aboriginal People's Television Network, Knowledge Network, NBC, and the National Film Board. I got jaded by religion and education and, uh, you know, um, substance abuse and whatnot. And uh, what always pulled me back was just little things that that my dad would tell me. I worked the whole summer. I was put, I was going to Kettle Island with me. Big canoe and a five horse kicker. We just Jerry was a little boy. We stopped there. Gary Newton was working there. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had 245 to me the rap. They had 7.5 Javelin Johnson. But they go a little bit faster than padding. So they borrowed my canoe at 15 bucks a day. That's a lot of money to me. Like one time he. He asked me about a certain person, like he wanted me to go and help them and something. And I said, well, I don't like that guy. And he said, don't hate anybody. Don't hate anybody. And that's all he said. He never really explained it. And uh, it comes, it's coming back to me now. It's like, yeah, you know, if you got a resentment against somebody and it kind of screws up your day because you're thinking about it all the time and, you know, you're trying to think of ways to get that person back. And he, he's not like that. Like. Uh, my dad's had lots of altercations with people in his time and, uh, you know, and it's just bygones are bygones and you just kind of let, you kind of just let it go and uh, hopefully learn, you know, hope you learn from it. We came up last year to do a short investigate shoot and that went really well, helped, uh, helped get our project going. So uh, we're back here, lucky to be back here with the crew and, um, yeah, we've been shooting now for a few days, we've got a few more days to go and, uh, it's gone, gone very well. Weather has been a little difficult, but uh, that's the way it goes, and we're, we're definitely enjoying up here. Very unique experience and uh, really, really rewarding in many ways. So we're, we're, uh, we're fortunate, fortunate to be, to be doing this project and, uh, and uh, really looking forward to doing more of it. Come back up in the fall to do, uh, do, do another shoot. Yeah. Hi, I'm Glenn Taylor. I'm the uh, cameraman, cinematographer on this uh, project with uh, Dennis and Victor and with Ken producing and uh, directing, associate directing, I guess. And um, we're up here at Baby Island. In the cold and the rain and the bugs. <laughs> we shot a lot of stuff looking at, at uh, his place and the, uh, yeah. the uncle's places. But we'll see where he's comfortable doing it and we'll just move around accordingly, I think. Our lights back here. But it's going well, it's going pretty good. Just sort of exactly what we thought. Ken's been here before with, uh, with David, our sound recordist, last year. So they filled me in fairly well on what to expect up here uh, as far as uh, the conditions and lighting and bugs. So uh, this is my first trip up here and uh, it's going pretty good. Very, uh, very enjoyable. Good company with uh, Victor and Dennis and the stories and the, and the kids. Uh, it's been going very well. I think we can. What we'll do is we'll just interview Dad. I cleaned out. Yeah. I cleaned out the house there, and we'll. Okay. So it's good. We'll just send the kids to the flats. Yeah. It's calmed down a little bit yeah. up there. It's not quite as cold. So. And I think we can get a good long one this time. Yeah, I think so. Okay. What I got here is uh, I'm holding uh, what we call the boom pole. You never call it the boom pole when you're uh, going into the airport, but it's uh, the fish pole. But it, it's it's just carbon fiber and it uh, extends. It's about this short and it goes out to about 10 feet and uh, what we have here is a suspension which holds the microphone and here we have the microphone and I have a few of these uh, I have different mics for different situations um, for example you might uh, be used to seeing something that looks more like this this is the the microphone I have here this is what I tend to use in my hand in the fishbowl the one that's moving 
uh, is what I tend to use for interior interviews. And then you get this big, uh, it's called a dead cat that's on it, the fur. Or big fur on it. Yeah, <laughs> the stray dog that was hanging around camp. <laughs> yes. And, 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 this, and this is used uh, 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 for exteriors and such, and it's called a shotgun microphone inside of it. And I first ran it past him maybe about a year and a half ago while I was living in Vancouver, working on uh, another series with him in Big Red Barn, a series called The Walk and the Hunt about the Saw Two people. So let's do that. We'll, we'll do a... Okay, stay out for a minute, boys. Stay out for a second. Stay out. What? No. Okay, keep out for a minute. Don't touch Thank that you, camera, you die. Thanks, Beck. So, what we'll do is we'll do a, spend some time here until he starts drifting off and yeah. and then we'll um, yeah. head over to Kendall. Well, while you guys, I'll set you guys up. Okay. I'll go over there. I'll set up a, set up a little paw yep. with, yep. Um, like all these guys over here are related, so I'm going to yeah. tell them what's going on. Okay. And then we'll, maybe we'll we can set up a meal and it can be a little, bullshit little, session, yeah, everybody sitting good. around and having a meal and, and that's what he likes to do a little walk on the even would it be from the beach where he could kind of walk and point and say this is where you know my yeah. the, my grandpa's schooner would yeah. be here and, and maybe Dave could wire both of us up yeah. and just um wire us up and then he, we could do a little two yep. shot of him and I yep. because I, I I don't really know a lot too no. like like well, he I'm sure I, I he told me at one time but I mean I forget yeah, it right down there, even a big man like him is smaller than a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> that stretch pretty long too, eh? Yeah. I got one right below me, the claim is about 14 miles. I was taking down a couple of uh, welfare students one year. I was in my little tin boat, and be beautiful weather, we got into that stretch, you know, that Louis stretch? Yeah. And we traveled for I don't know how many hours, and they were fighting mosquitoes. He asked me, where are we? I said, we're in a big lake, we're going to better look for channel. <laughs> <laughs> he went to sleep on it. He said, I told him we were in a big lake, I'll go look for channel later on. Tom, Tom. <laughs> when I got to the end of Apocalypse Park, you know where we had kids, I think? Yeah. You go right on both sides, you're going to hit the same place. Yeah. So we got around there and, said, and one of them said, oh, you found a river. Oh, I make rivers when I'm traveling. <laughs> <laughs> they had too many stupid people. <laughs> you get off the plane, we fly up from Vancouver, and you get off the plane and up here. And uh, it's funny how everybody just sort of acclimatizes. You arrive on the island and it never really, it gets a little, it gets sort of, it gets darker, but it doesn't get dark. And uh, you go to bed around two or three in the morning. You don't feel like it's two or three in the morning. It feels like it's seven o'clock in the in the evening. And uh, people kind of have a nap. You get up again at maybe ten in the morning. You sleep. Get up at ten, shoot for a while, and then come three or four or five or six in the in the afternoon. You have another nap. Um, this just seems how it's going. Sort of a couple naps, you know, and you work till two or three in the morning. Sometimes four in the morning if the light's beautiful. And uh, you just sort of get on this strange schedule, but it works. Ah, there's a poignant moment. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is where Starbucks got the idea from. <laughs> I think they came up here and they had six scoops of really cheap coffee and you just boil the <laughs> out of it. And it comes out kind of gooey. It, I don't know if he's going to be able to stir that or if a spoon's going to be able to hold up in there. Oh yeah, well this thing fell out on the it's a screw that holds this whole thing together onto the lens, but it, it fell out uh, during shipment and all the planes we were on rattling. And Did you have to get a special engineer in to get it? Yeah, to we it? had to call in a special engineer from, uh, from town there. We're shooting on high definition, um, which is uh, quite a good thing for this environment. It's, it, it's tougher in the fact that it's a bigger camera, it takes a lot of power, so We've got a ge uh, generator on the island here that was brought in for us to keep the keep the batteries charged. 
because uh, the camera uses a lot of batteries. But the uh, upside of that in shooting in high definition is uh, the pictures are uh, wonderful. You get a really uh, you get a really good sense of the landscape here, um, and the image uh, really brings you into the environment of how uh, of how they live here. Um, pretty desolate, but within that desolation is this beauty and uh, that high definition really helps that. It really brings you into that environment um, in the widescreen format. We're shooting 16.9, I think, hopefully broadcast on 16 by 9, which is the big widescreen. And um, with the high definition, we'll uh, really get a good sense of what it's like to be up here and live up here and, and uh, be in this environment, which is uh, pretty unique. I like to have the crew up here for one summer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure her golden spoon is well polished <laughs> with blubber pot. <laughs> no, we wouldn't do that. I was living in Vancouver for three years and, and uh, you know, the traffic and it was really getting to me. And I just kept thinking, well, you know, pretty soon I'll be up at Baby Island. In a few more months I'll drive home and I'll be out at the whale camp and everything will be okay. You got no worries, you don't even know what day it is or, you know, what time it is. And I've got no real desire to know what time it is, you know. It's like, you just live out here and you do what you have to do. And, um, so I always wanted to uh, kind of uh, pay tribute to him and his generation too by doing this film. My dad had come from Kettle Island and I gave him, a, you know, a check to give it to Hudson Bay and all kinds of groceries. I had to stop there. I never made it. I never made it. I was going to go by uh, Tuapaluk and Jaya Lake, sir. Huh? Oh. had a good time. Because a lot of the, uh, his generation, they all share that same philosophy. They don't, they don't really, um, you know, they don't hold resentments and they don't hold grudges against anybody and they're pretty forgiving and, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, when they were growing up, like you couldn't hold a resentment against anybody. Uh, your next door neighbor, you know, you might, you might need, you might need your next door neighbor down the road. You might need to borrow something from him someday, and or, or he might need his help. And uh, you know, you can't, you can't afford to resent anybody. You just gotta um, live together. And that's what it was like in those old days. I guess you just lived together and, uh, you know, you, you depended on one another. Um, if somebody was ran out of food, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna spite the, your neighbor by not giving him any food. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna help him out if, you know, as much you can. And that's what I get from my dad. And, and uh, it helps me out in troubled waters, you know, like, when things are not going too good, or I start getting resentments, because I got a, I got a pretty, pretty uh, short temper sometimes, and gets the best of me, and I get resentments against people and stuff like that. And so I always think back on that, and so I wanted to kind of pay tribute to that, and <clears throat> maybe someday we can have a film, and you know pay respect to the to our parents. Go in. Hello boss. Hello there. Uh, how you doing? Good. Long time no see. Yeah, good to see you. Hello, yo. <laughs> okay, good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's been there. That time again you gotta have a little mucked, eh? Yeah. <laughs> How's Holly? Pretty good. We got uh, one. Lots of muck to eat, is he don't go there no more. Are you gonna... Are you gonna get another one? I don't know. I've got quite a bit now. Oh, Jerry yeah. took some in and... I've got a little thing... I've got a little thing that I've made. Oh, yeah? Yeah, good luck to two, two buckets. You bush cap? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think Jerry wants to get another one, maybe. I would know. You could make it bigger. Yeah. Dennis and I have worked previously on uh, two documentaries called The Walk and the Hunt. Um, 
we met a few years back and uh, had some mutual interest in uh, in the kind of projects that uh, he was working on. So uh, we've uh, found that uh, it's a good team. Dennis is a, a great writer and director. Well, we should marry two tough people. Umok's uh, granddaughter. So Nuxan was from Alaska? Oh, yeah. He came into his herding, that herding too. I like doing the producing side of things, and um, so we're, we're looking forward to doing this and, and, uh, and a few more things in the future. I don't know, he came in when we was very young. He was working on a steamboat, dollar a day or something like that. Two bucks maybe. And I always wanted to do a film about my dad because he's such a character and he has such a kind of odd perspective that you don't run into every day. And, uh, and he's, been, he's been my hero like any kid. You know, your dad is your hero and you look up to him and he's pretty special. So. I always wanted to kind of pay tribute to him uh, by doing this film uh, because he's done a lot for me and he's taught me a lot. And he came down in the early 40s. He came on uh, Hudson Bay, maybe one of the distributors, maybe. The Bakuakai coming, you know, the Zibaku, right? Yeah. Yeah. He could marry to the country people. Just like that, just like Andrew Barr's crew there, mm -hmm. like Nuxon and Edwin and Mark, Mark Nuxon and Edward, Edwin Allen, and uh, Terence, Terence Nidler. They support, they're allowed to go back huh, when they finish here, yeah. according to the radio project. They're supposed to go back to Alaska. But they married into the Delta, Delta girls. And one of them got to be my uncle. Did one? That's right. Joseph Allen's dad was from that same herd. They call him the Iron Man, tough. One of the interesting things about the shoot is it's not very controlled in terms of, you know, having a, a schedule and we're going to be shooting this and then we're going to move to this. Um, we try a little bit to make a plan and that may work and it may completely change in the next 30 seconds but uh, because we're just we're filming life as it happens in many ways and we're kind of working around the, the life of the of you know of our main character Victor Allen and you know if he's got work to do he's got something to do and he's he's not going to be waiting for us to to set something up or ask him to do something again and um, so you, some people might find that a little difficult because it definitely goes against the grain of how we like to control things in a production, but in many ways it's a lot of fun too. And uh, you, you know, you, you set up and something happens and you go, and it's, you gotta be ready to go. And there's, you know, there's a whale coming in and, and it's, you gotta be shooting in five minutes or you miss it. So part of the challenge is having good people too. And um, we're pretty fortunate, you know, I, I, David and I came up last year and sort of we knew the environment and you know not every cameraman or sound man wants to, to sleep in a tent and on the tundra for you know 10 days and and not have a shower and a king-size bed and you know that that uh, it's so we're fortunate to find you know people who enjoy that who enjoy the challenge and, and the opportunity to be out here that are also very talented at what they do and and don't mind the spur of the moment kind of shoot you know, and where something's going to happen, maybe it's really busy for quite a few hours, and then we may not, we may sit around and drink coffee for four or five hours because I mean, nothing, nothing's going to happen for that time. So um, that's a bit, bit of a challenge, but I think it's a fun challenge that uh, that makes it a little more interesting to be up here doing that, doing this kind of shoot. Come October, they call it Ray Allen because some survey or some were probably half starved just to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of English names around here are implemented here by explorers. You know the guys that 
He say, I found the land for you. Well, we were there. We, we didn't find it. <laughs> we were lying on it. It was there. We washed it out a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Not too bad things like that. Uh, it's, we were weak at trying to figure out that. Yeah. One time, there was a couple of executives from the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation that came out here. And these are the guys that make big decisions for us people, and they'd never been out here before. And they came out, and they spent a few days out here, and they just kind of lost track of time and everything. They just, one guy just put his watch away. He didn't want to know what time it was anymore. And he said, I can see why this is so important now. And it really helped him with his job. Producing, as, as Victor Allen would put it, is the administrating. Um, basically, my job is to uh, put the proposal, take an idea, put the proposal together and sell that idea to broadcasters and funders, um, put the financing together, then once the financing is together for a project, um, put the crew together and put the production together. And so basically the producer is an administrator in many ways. We're just overseeing everything and making sure that everybody's in the right place at the right time and that everything gets done. Um, we're not as involved creatively as, as the other components, um, although the producer does it get involved in the editing at the end and uh, because they're working with the broadcaster to ensure that the final product is something that the broadcaster is also happy with so um, it's kind of a little bit of everything producing uh, but, uh, but I enjoy it. So I'm responsible for the soundtrack and that means I just uh, everything from the interviews, any dialogue that happens, we're always trying to build a scene and whatnot and I'm always keeping a close eye on Glenn and Dennis and we kind of make it up as we go along but we are trying to do scene building and um, I'm trying to get all the bits and pieces for the soundtrack for the editor to put together a scene which means um, I have to pick my battles carefully. I uh, Sometimes uh, I'll record what I can of the uh, dialogue that happens like you know Victor's chopping wood and talking to Delma or any of the other family members, I just kind of do my best there, then I might just go afterwards and get a little bit of what's called a wild track, which means it was recorded without the uh, without picture. I might get some bits and pieces of wood chopping sounds, I might record a little bit of wind. If we're near the water and the camera saw that, I might record that separately. And I just collect bits and pieces basically for the editor. For you guys to come up here and experience experience kind of our <clears throat> our existence, because Basically, we've been forced to live by southern standards and southern cultures and practices and by, you know, live by the clock and whatnot. So it's good because you're going to go back and you're going to be an ambassador for us and for the North, you know. It's not going to be your typical formatted kind of documentary uh, that we're following a specific story from start to end. It will be more abstract in a way, more vignettes. Um, we'll be following Victor Allen through his life but it's more about his perspective, not about his life. His life is part of what has given him that perspective. The old line set a station there and turned around, took that Inuk, Inupiaq name away from it and they made Barsi and all this. He had ice out there, they probably slide that one too. So we're going to move kind of effortlessly back and forth as we go through the story and um, so I think it'd be quite unique in that way, and um, th and that's pretty appealing for the festival circuit, and that's something the National Film Board would like to do is to to see it go on the festival circuit and 